the end. So welcome to uh, Medicine Grand Rounds for this week. Um, this week is the first of um, a series that will be scattered throughout the second half here of the academic year of um, updates that um, our divisions um, are putting on updates in their um, in uh, in the uh, uh, subspecialty area um, uh, that are important and new over the past year or so. And so I'm really excited um, that cardiology has agreed to sort of launch this series um, this week with recent updates in cardiology. And uh, uh, in, in general, many of these will um, have multiple speakers sort of giving um, highlights uh, in their areas of particular interest. And this week um, is uh, an example of that. And so we'll have three speakers from the Division of Cardiology today. Um, I'm going to introduce all of them now at the beginning and then let them just shift between each other through the um, course of the hour. And at the end, please save your questions or feel free to type them in the chat because I will monitor them. And at the end, we will ask all three speakers to be available to answer questions. So I'm delighted um, then to uh, start and introduce our three speakers. Um, Dr. Mahmoud Abdu will kick us off. Um, he's an assistant professor of medicine um, with a particular interest in advanced heart failure and transplant cardiology. And he will be speaking to us about new paradigm shifts in evidence-based treatment of heart failure in 2021. I was lucky to know Dr. Abdu as a fellow and I'm so thrilled to see him back here at Emory uh, as faculty now. He will be followed by uh, Dr. Brian Wells, who's an associate professor of medicine and the director of vascular medicine in the division of cardiology. And he will speak to us about a topic that has become near and dear uh, to us, which are vascular manifestations of COVID-19. And I'm uh, anxious to hear um, the updates on thoughts about this. And then um, finally, Dr. Jefferson Baer, an assistant professor of medicine in the Division of Cardiology, um, will uh, give us an update on triglycerides and cardiovascular disease. So thanks uh, in advance to the three of you for being willing to do this. And I'm very excited for you to update my um, not current knowledge uh, about cardiology. And so Dr. Abdu, let me uh, ask you to go ahead and kick it off. Thank you, Dr. Armstrong. Uh, it's uh, uh, an honor and uh, really excitement for me to uh, participate and uh, be part of M Medicine Ground Rounds. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Now, uh, I shared my screen. Can, uh, can you see it? We sure can. Perfect. So um, I'll be talking today about uh, new paradigm shifts in treatment of heart failure in 2021. Um, I have no financial disclosures related to this topic. Talk, focus on um, three learning objectives. Uh, the last two years were very exciting and, um, and fully loaded years when it comes to therapeutics and management of heart failure with reduced EF. Uh, many new therapeutic agents were tested. A lot, uh, uh, a lot of exciting clinical trials were published and a plethora of new data surfacing. Uh, for the next 15 minutes, I will try to review the latest um, updates um, uh, in the data, data concerning the use of ARNIs in the management of half -ref patients. We will discuss briefly the implementation of the newcomers to the heart failure therapeutic family, which are, which are the SGLT2 inhibitors. And I'll spend some time at the end and talk about how these new emerging therapeutics uh, are changing the way we practice with highlights on some of the challenges that we face. Uh, just a quick reminder, yes, we are in the middle of a nasty and deadly pandemic of SARS-CoV-2, but let's not forget that this pandemic came on top of a lot of challenges that we already face, uh, a true epidemic of heart failure. The prevalence of heart failure is escalating rapidly, with around 6.2 million people uh, currently living in the United States with heart failure. Uh, this is only projected to increase to about 45%, approximating 9 million people, uh, patients living with heart failure by year 2030. Uh, heart failure is responsible for 800,000 to a million. Compounding this, heart failure is an illness that consumes substantial healthcare uh, resources, more than 40 billion a year. Uh, uh, billion dollars a year uh, are dedicated to therapy of for heart failure. Um, Two million annual physician visits, um, and, and it's a disease that inflicts considerable morbidity and mortality, and greatly affects the quality of life. With about 50% of the patients uh, expected to be dead in five years. 
the latest uh, or the last ACC AHFA, AHA, HFSA guidelines for treatment of heart failure was published, believe it or not, in 2013. We haven't had an official guideline update since then. It's projected to be coming out soon. But in between, since 2013, there was uh, an update in 2016 and another update in 2017. But by the end of year 2017, there was a very important and foundational expert consensus decision pathway for heart failure management in the outpatient setting. This document um, addressed the 10 pivotal issues about management of heart failure with reduced EF. After that, in 2019, another expert consensus decision pathway was focusing on uh, inpatient uh, management and hospitalized patients with heart failure with, with, uh, uh, with heart failure in general and HEFREF in particular. Just a few weeks ago, an update to the 2017 document uh, was published by uh, the ACC in JAK. And this is uh, fo this focused on supplementing the 2017 uh, expert consensus opinion, given new uh, given that there, there's new data from uh, emerging studies, and to continue to provide concise and to the point practical guidance for management of HEFREF. Today, I will discuss the key update included in this document concerning medical management of heart failure. This is a snapshot of the 2017 document uh, implementing for the first time the use of angiotensin receptor neprilysin inhibitors, ARNI, uh, Secubitril valsartan is the only agent we have in this class for now as a class one indication for medical management of HEFREF. Uh, this came after the results of the very impressive um, Paradigm HF trial uh, or study in 2014. It also gave guidance on the use of a novel agent, Evabridine, which is an IF channel blocker, highly selective for sinoatrial node pacemaker current. In the interim, uh, new data came, uh, became available from results of well-designed clinical trial. This is a snapshot from the latest document that I was talking about, which is the 2021 uh, expert consensus document um, on medical management of HEFREF in the outpatient setting. In the 2021 document, you can see that ARNI now has became, uh, took a, an advanced uh, position in management of heart failure with reduced EF as a foundation uh, foundational therapeutic agent uh, that is used. Um, the 2021 document also expanded on the role of ARNI uh, in number one, they're used in, as a de novo therapy in patients naive to ACE inhibitors or ARBs. Uh, number two, the evidence of rapid improvement in patient reported outcome measures, symptoms, functional, uh, 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 physical fu functioning, quality of life. Uh, number three, it the, the, the demonstration of reverse remodeling effect of ARNIs in chronic heart failure with reduced EF, independent of background therapy with ACE or ARB, and we will highlight some of these data today. Another important development in the 2021 document since the publication of the previous uh, uh, document was the FDA, FDA approval of two candidate SGLT2 inhibitors and, uh, originally designed to treat diabetes. And, and now they are, the, uh, they are in addition to the arsenal of medications available for treatment of patients with HEFREF. As anyone can imagine, in light of these developments, management of heart failure with reduced EF has become a little bit more complex. Um, so an update on when and how to add, switch, and titrate all heart failure therapies to a maximally tolerated doses or ideally target doses was deemed important. Let's refresh our memory a little bit with the landmark uh, Paradigm HF uh, study that was published in 2014. Um, an important uh, uh, trial uh, uh, included almost 8,400 patients with HEFREF, an EF of less than 35% on stable doses of ACE and ARBs and other guideline-directed medical therapy. Uh, patients were uh, randomized to either receive secubitril valsartan or enalapril. Paradigm HF demonstrated uh, that secubitril valsartan resulted in a relative risk reduction of almost 20% in the primary outcome, which is a composite of cardiovascular death or heart failure hospitalization. Uh, also, beyond that, it demonstrated 20% 20, 20 reduction in sudden cardiac death, with a number need to treat to prevent one primary endpoint was 21. Since then, the uh, LCZ-696, which was the precursor of, of, of the, this medication, further got FDA approval and was um, marketed under the name Secubital Valsartan, or as all, most of us know it, as Entresto. 
The Pioneer HF study came uh, after the Paradigm AHF and established that the initiation of RNA during an acute decompensated heart failure hospitalization is feasible after the patient has been hemodynamically stabilized with significant lowering of the nt pro BMP uh, serum biomarker uh, compared to enalapril. It is worth noting that up to 25% of patients in that trial developed significant hypotension when treated with secubital valsartan. Therefore, uh, an, a note is that you want to make sure ensure that patients are not volume depleted at the time of initiation of uh, secubital valsartan. That may help to avoid this issue. After Pioneer HF results were published, it left us wondering if the robust reduction in NT pro BMP levels by the use of valsartan, uh, secubital valsartan resulted in any meaningful clinical outcomes. The Prove HF study uh, addressed this. It was published a few months ago and did answer that question in the Prove HF trial. After 12 months of therapy with uh, in secubital valsartan, the median EF increased from 28 to 37 percent. Other important findings observed from the study was that the in indices of reverse remodeling improved significantly with therapy, including reduction in the left ventricular end diastolic and end systolic volume index. More, moreover, markers of diastolic dysfunction also improved, like left atrial, uh, left atrial volume index or the e and the E to E prime ratio. Notably, the results from Prove HF were demonstrated in an important subgroup that was not represented in Paradigm HF trial, uh, and those were the patients who were de novo heart failure patients or naive to ACE inhibitors or ARBs, amongst a lot of other subgroups as well. This is a snapshot of a, the di of a diagram uh, from the gui uh, on guidance of how to use ARNIs uh, in the 2021 document. I want to highlight a few clinical points here. Number one, uh, a frequent question comes up is whether to use an aldosterone antagonist uh, and whether their use is mandatory before initiation of ARNI. There's no existing pre data to suggest that aldosterone antagonist uh, use is mandatory before ARNI. So lack of treatment with an aldosterone antagonist should not delay initiation or switching a patient to an ARNI. Number two, when making the transitioning, transition from an ACE inhibitor to an ARNI, a 36-hour washout period should be strictly observed to avoid uh, angioedema. This delay should not be, it should, is not required if you're switching from an ARB to an ARNI. So only use the 36-hour washout if, if the patient is already on an ACE. But if the patient is already on an ARB, you can go ahead and change them right away. And, I, and number three, which is very important, an ideal time to consider therapy uh, optimization and initiation of ARNI is actually during a hospitalization for heart failure with reduced EF. This is not new. Uh, this is not a new recommendation 2021. Actually, it was detailed in 2019 update. Uh, however, the transition study demonstrated that uh, about one half of the patient could achieve a target dose uh, of Entresto uh, or Secubital Valsartan in 10 weeks after in-hospital uh, initiation. Number four, uh, because of the hypotensive effect of secubital valsartan, careful administration is advised. And in non-congested uh, patients, a modest reduction in loop diuretics doses can be considered. Some limitations to the use of ARNIs that were worth mentioning, uh, it is not yet clear that de novo initiation is best for all patients with half breath. Um, uh, you know, patients who are hypotensive at baseline or had very advanced heart failure, um, and there's uh, also the challenge uh, of access to care, to treatment. Some patients, uh, uh, in some patients, and they're you know out of pocket, high out of pocket uh, costs, and so on and so forth. Let's uh, change gears a little bit and talk about the newcomers to the family, which are the sodium glucose co-transporter two or SGLT two inhibitors. The mechanism of benefit from these agents in HEFREF remains uncertain. However, uh, we think that because SGLT2 inhibitors lead to osmotic diuresis, naturesis, they decrease the arterial pressure and stiffness and shift to a ketone-based uh, myocardial um, uh, metabolism um, is beneficial and may be the main reason why these medicines work. The first study to demonstrate the efficacy of SGLT2 inhibitors was uh, seen in the DAPA, DAPA HF study. Um, you can see the details of the study right here in the screen, on the screen in front of you. It demonstrated that the uh, dapagliflozin caused a significant reduction, about 30% of heart failure hospitalizations and 18% reduction in cardiovascular death. 
Similarly, uh, the emperor reduced study uh, showed very similar effects, and this was uh, this study used uh, impagliflozin, in, in another SGLT2 inhibitor. And moreover, it showed that uh, it showed significant slowing in the decline of GFR and slowing of the progression of chronic kidney disease in patients uh, who have heart failure. Um, So, as you can see, the clinical decision making has become even more complicated in the current era of heart failure with reduced ejection fraction therapeutics. On top of the addition of RNEs and SGLT2 inhibitors, as we discussed in the previous slide, the uh, other agents like uh, a soluble guanylate cyclase stimulator, Vera Sigwat, studied in the Victoria study, um, a novel activator of cardiac myosin um, called um, uh, uh, omicaptive miracable in the galactic HF trial. Both have shown modestly reduction, modest reduction in heart failure hospitalizations and cardiovascular death in HEFREF patients. Uh, both these agents are not FDA approved at this time for the use of HEFREF, but more to come on that. Ongoing large phase three, three, three trials are assessing the impact of intravenous iron on the morbidity and mortality in patients with heart failure with reduced EF in the AFFIRM AHF trial and the FAIR HF2 trial, which are ongoing right now. Because ARNI, SGLT2 inhibitors, Verisugwat, Omicaptive Maracable, and potential others that are in the pipeline have not been evaluated either incrementally or, uh, or directly against each other, guess what? The management has been extremely complicated in, in an already challenging and complex patient population. However, we as clinicians must continue to decide on how to uh, use and sequence multiple new therapeutics and treat our patients regardless. In an effort uh, to provide a decision-making framework, uh, the Heart Failure, Heart Failure Collaboratory uh, Group convened a multi-stakeholder group, uh, including patients, clinicians, clinical investigators, the FDA, uh, pharmaceutical and industry uh, payers. Different approaches to this complex framework were suggested, and uh, further prospective studying uh, to anal analyze these approaches is needed paving the road for an emerging uh, for emerging of a very much needed implementation science to catch up and keep up with the pace with discovery science in heart failure with reduced EF. But until then, the current approach in a, cl uh, in a clinical practice should be of comprehensive therapy approach, incorporating all life prolonging uh, therapies. This approach should serve as a bedrock for heart failure with reduced ejection fraction therapy. Uh, treatment should uh, always be consistent uh, or consistent of four therapies modifying five disease pathways, a beta blocker, dual renin angiotensin neprilysin inhibitor, aldosterone inhibition, and SGATL2 inhibitors, which we will call quadruple therapy. This should be our objective until we develop precision medicine, integrate novel data uh, analytics, uh, uh, ap applications of artificial intelligence, leverage ph uh, pharmacogenomics, uh, and to allow for better disease genotyping and phenotyping, which is ongoing and it's robust in this area. In summary, um, heart failure is a complex syndrome typically associated with multiple comorbidities, most patients are on, on multiple medications. We are now living in a very exciting era of rapidly expanding robust therapeutics for patients with HEFREF. For now and until implementation science converges upon discovery science, at least modulating five disease modifying pathways with four therapies remains a core approach. Um, uh, this is very important. I would just want to emphasize if you have time and please make time to read uh, this 20 and 20, 2021 expert consensus decision pathway. This is a must read for any clinician who takes care of HEFREF, uh, with eject, uh, HEFREF patients. Um, not only does it uh, cover medical management, but it also covers when to refer to a heart failure specialist, uh, uh, how to overcome barriers of complex and high cost, uh, high cost medications, so on and so forth. And for that, I will hand it over to Dr. Brian Wells. Thanks, Mahmoud. Okay, Mahmoud, can you see that screen? Looks great. Okay, thanks so much. Yes, I can. And thanks again, Wendy, for the invitation. 
in allowing us to do this cardiology update for you and share, share some of our thoughts in particular vascular manifestations of COVID-19. Today, we're going to focus on the venous thromboembolism aspect of COVID-19. And I feel like this is important because it's so common. Venous thromboembolism occurs in up to 30% of patients with COVID-19, and this is relevant. This is something we're all seeing in our practice, whether we're inpatient or outpatient. And I think this topic is particularly timely because we're starting to have some data published or around this topic to help give us some guidance on how to appropriately manage these patients. And in fact, a, a, a large clinical trial that we're involved with just released their interim data approximately 10 days ago. And I'll show you those data uh, during this talk that is uh, hot off the press. So I, again, I appreciate your time and attention. So this is the trial I mentioned to you, the ATT&CK trial, and I'll, I'll share with you the data towards the end of this talk, and it is funded by the Canadian Institutes of, of Health Research pertaining to this topic. Learning objectives, we'd like to understand the hypercoagulable effects of COVID-19, know how to risk stratify and evaluate for venous thromboembolism in COVID-19 patients, treat COVID-19 patients with appropriate levels of anticoagulation, so in 15 minutes or less, we'll touch on the pathophysiology of SARS-CoV-2, review the epidemiology of venous thromboembolism in COVID-19 patients. We'll touch on risk stratification and diagnosis using D-dimer and venous duplex ultrasound respectively. The treatment for venous thromboembolism based on our EMRI protocol. And, and finally, I'll present to you the, the attack results. So to bring this into clinical context, I wanted, wanted you to think about a typical case that you might see in the hospital. This is a 50 year old man presents to the emergency room with cough, shortness of breath and fever for two days. He's admitted to the hospital floor. He's COVID-19 positive. His blood pressure is 130 over 82. His heart rate's 100. Oxygen saturation's 88%. Weight 80 kilograms. Creatinine is normal. His D-dimer is elevated. So because of the hypoxemia tachycardia, presentation with the elevated D-dimer, you do a venous duplex ultrasound and a CTPE protocol, both of which are negative. So thinking about this patient, what dose of anticoagulation would you recommend? So uh, I want you to just think about these options. You don't have to unmute yourself or vote, but you could do none or early ambulation for DVT prophylaxis. Heparin's 5,000 units, Q8 hours, low molecular weight heparin, 0.5 mg per kg daily, low molecular weight heparin, one mg per kg daily, or low molecular weight heparin, one mg per kg, Q12 hours. So how would you anticoagulate this patient admitted to the floor? So this is an, a nice little cardiovascular summary of the effects of SARS-CoV-2. So you, you, a patient presents with a viral syndrome and moving towards the left, they have risk factors, including the acute illness, but all, all of these other risk factors when the patient presents with SARS-CoV-2 generates this profound inflammatory response. You develop endothelial dysfunction, perhaps superimposed infection. You'll see lymphopenia, inflammatory cytokines, including interleukin-6 and CRP. The hemostatic abnormalities, Pulmonary microthrombi and thrombo, uh, microthrombo uh, embolic events are, are particularly common. You'll see increased oxygen requirements. You'll see um, uh, shunting, intravascular coagulopathy, myocardial injury, cardiac biomarkers are increased. And on your blood counts, you'll see elevated D-dimer, fiber degradation products, and increased levels of PT. With all that going on, you have microthrombi, uh, macrothrombi. The most common micro, uh, cardiovascular event is probably venous thromboembolism. Like I said, 30% uh, in ICU patients. Less commonly, we'll see myocardial infarction and rarely disseminated intravascular coagulation. But you've seen these patients, they're clotting their catheters, they're having arterial events, including MI and stroke, and, and need to be managed aggressively. And a lot of you have seen this, this cartoon on how SARS-CoV-2 leads to inflammation. inflammation. So the, car, the CoV-2 virus is surrounded by these spike proteins and they bind the ACE2 receptor and that's how the, the CoV-2 virus gains access into the cell. And by doing that, it's down-regulating ACE2. Well, that 
has a downstream effects for inflammation, right? Because ACE2 assists with the conversion of angiotensin 2 to angiotensin 1-7. Angiotensin 1-7 is anti-inflammatory, antioxidants. It's a, uh, it, it creates a healthy environment. If you have a buildup in, of angiotensin 2 with, a, with this local infection or sepsis in this buildup, the, the downstream effect here with the down regulation of ACE2 inhibitors, excuse me, ACE2 receptors is acute lung injury, myocardial remodeling, remodeling vasoconstriction and vascular permeability, all of which have uh, catastrophic impacts potentially for the patient. So what do we know about VTE incidents in COVID-19? So a lot of these observational data have been coming out the past few months. These are, this is the 30% I keep quoting to you. It's approximately 200 patients in a Dutch ICU. And, and from these observational data, they found that approximately 30% of these patients are having VTE. The majority are pulmonary embolism, a few DVTs, and a few of the arterial events occurred, all of which in this instance were, were related to ischemic stroke. And in the uh, American study that was similar, we, uh, we compared ARDS patients who are non-COVID with ARDS patients who are COVID positive, and we found a statistically significant increase in venous thromboembolic events in the COVID-19 patients, primarily due to venous thromboembolism. What do we know about D-dimer? So elevated D-dimer is associated with work, worse outcomes, particularly thrombosis, as well as mort mortality. The uh, ISTH recommends D-dimer testing on patients hospitalized with COVID-19, but it's unclear if D-dimer should be used to determine the level of anticoagulation. So we can use this to restratify, but we don't quite know what to do with this tool and, and how to deal with it. Wanted to mention POCUS, point of care ultrasound, for those of you who are using it. So this is a document that was proposed by the American Society for ECHO in, in, this, in the context of COVID, saying that if a sonographer is not available in the context of the COVID pandemic, that a two-point compression, POCUS, or point of care ultrasound technique, could and should be considered by practitioners who are trained in this modality. And I think this is important for COVID patients because we're trying to get information quickly. Again, we're trying to diagnose and risk stratify, particularly for venous thromboembolic disease. And we're also trying to limit exposure to the patients and our providers, in particular our sonographers who spend 30 to 45 minutes with a patient. This is, a, this is an effective way of evaluating the patient quickly and getting this information with limited exposure to the patient. And this modality can be, you can be trained in, in less than a day on this to be effective with a sensitivity of a two point compression ultrasound of 80-ish percent and a specificity of over 90%. Two-point compression occurs in the common femoral vein and the popliteal vein, and you can also add a third point of compression in the femoral vein to increase the sensitivity of the examination. So based on this increased incidence of venous thromboembolism and, and the way these patients are presenting with COVID-19, we started anecdotally, right, and tre uh, treating these patients more aggressively with anticoagulation, knowing that they're that they're going to clot. So, if we can stay ahead of this, can we improve outcomes? And this this is a, a large study uh, of over two thousand patients uh, from ICUs in New York. Uh, all patients on the left side, I ICU patients. Uh, on the right in, in, that were mechanically ventilated. And they compared patients who were receiving uh, therapeutic anticoagulation with those receiving non-therapeutic anticoagulation. And you can see in both patient groups that, that there's a survival benefit in this observational data with therapeutic anticoagulation. Clearly there's, there's some degree of, of survival bias here with these types of obs observational data, but this it suggests that in, in the appropriate patient, the therapeutic anticoagulation will improve outcomes. So we're starting to see more of these data and we're doing this anecdotally. And this has been our experience clinically at Emory as well. And based on this, a lot of institutions around the country have done similar protocols, but we have a three-tiered three, three -tiered protocol for treating our patients with COVID-19 levels one, two, and three. So level one would be standard prophylaxis for patients without thrombus and have a low D-dimer. And you can treat with low molecular weight heparin, 0.5 milligrams per kilogram per day, uh, more of a prophylactic dose. And if there's any renal insufficiency, heparin could be considered. Level two is intermediate dosing. That would be a patient without known thrombus, in a D-dimer that's over 3,000. So we do use that D-dimer tool as a way of risk stratifying and saying this patient's at higher risk for thrombosis. 
So the treatment dose there is low molecular weight heparin, one mg per kg per day. And treating at discharge, uh, highlighted in, in the blue here, four to six weeks with either DOAC or low molecular weight heparin. Level three is therapeutic dosing. That's for patients with a known or suspected DVT or an un un other otherwise unexplained oxygen requirement, dead space organ failure. The patients are getting sicker. They're having microvascular disease and thrombi and need to be treated aggressively. They're treated with low molecular weight heparin, one milligram per kilogram BID and on discharge treated for at least three months with anticoagulant DOAC or low molecular weight heparin. So that was our in, in, Emory anticoagulation protocol based on a lot of the uh, cohort observational data. And again, similar to studies, uh, to protocols that are uh, used all over the country, which brings us to some of the randomized trials. Emory was a part of the ATT&CK trial. We were enrolling patients at Emory Midtown, it stands for the antithrombotic therapy to ameliorate complications of COVID-19. So this is a randomized con uh, control trial. It was global in scale, led by the University of Manitoba, included sites from Canada, United States, Brazil, and Mexico. And the design is randomizing patients to therapeutic low molecular weight heparin or infractionated heparin versus standard of care at that institution. And they're followed for 14 days or until hospital discharge. In order to get more uh, powerful data more quickly in a timely fashion, the ATT&CK trial combined with two other trials of similar design to form the multi-platform RCT. So the REMAP and ACTIVE four trials were combined. They had similar trial design and they combined endpoints to, uh, to hopefully get results faster. And that's what they did. Um, and because they had similar trial design, we were able to combine these data. And uh, in case I didn't know, these are patients who are randomized within 72 hours of admission and not on mechanical ventilation. The primary outcome is organ support free days to day 21. Other secondary outcomes were safety, including bleeding and, and heparin induced thrombocytopenia, efficacy, mortality, thrombosis, intubation, length of stay, and the interim analysis that was just released approximately 10 days ago included over 2000 patients. We, we started to see a signal in the severe state or, or ICU level care patients in December where we may have been causing harm and there was a pause in enrollment since December in ICU level care patients. But these are how the, how the patient population um, strata were divided. So moderate state is non-ICU patients and those were further divided into low D-dimer versus high D-dimer groups. We also had a missing D-dimer group where D-dimer wasn't, wasn't utilized. And then the severe state is the ICU care. So the, again, these data are hot off the press. For the moderate state patients who are non-ICU, the, the, the requirement for organ support was 23% for the prophylactic anticoagulation dose and 16% for the therapeutic anticoagulation dose. So we showed superiority at that point for moderate state, non-ICU, both low D-dimer and high D-dimer patients. And we met the preset specified criteria for futility or causing harm in the severe state ICU patients. So we have not been enrolling ICU, enrolling ICU patients since December. Uh, some of the secondary outcomes here, moderate state with therapeutic anticoagulation mortality was reduced. Bleeding was slightly increased, but at a, a, a relatively acceptable rate at less than 2% and thrombotic events were obviously decreased with the therapeutic anticoagulation. In the severe state ICU patients, mortality was increased, unfortunately. There was an increased risk for bleed, but at a uh, seemingly acceptable rate of 3.7, or ex I shouldn't say acceptable, expected rate of 3.7% and a reduction in thrombotic events. So the conclusions from the multi-platform RCT is that in moderate, moderate state, non-ICU patients with COVID-19 therapeutic dose anticoagulation is superior to standard of care with regards to organ support free days with a uh, major bleeding rate of less than 2%. In the severe state, unfortunately, therapeutic heparin did not improve the organ support free days to day 21, and there was an increase in major bleeding at 3.7%, and, and it also increased mortality as well. And the why... The question is why do the severe state patients not benefit from anticoagulation? It appears based on these data that there is a sweet spot and you'd like to capture these patients early in their diagnosis and early in their admission so they don't progress to severe state ICU level of care. And so it seems to be important 
to start the therapeutic anticoagulation early in the patient's course. And in the severe state, when they've made it to the ICU, it's too late. So going back to our patient, she, he was a 50 year old man admitted to the floor, COVID-19 positive, D-dimer of 4,000. So how would you have managed that patient? Based on the Emory protocol, we would have treated with low molecular weight heparin, one mg per kg daily. And perhaps based on the attack protocol, we would now treat a little more aggressively with low molecular weight heparin, one mg per kg Q12 hours based on the, these data that have just been presented. So in conclusion, COVID-19 increases your risk for thrombotic events. Patients with COVID-19 can be further restratified with a D-dimer level. There should be a low threshold for testing for venous thromboembolism in these patients. Non-ICU patients with COVID-19 treated with therapeutic anticoagulation, emphasizing early in their admission, have fewer days of organ-free support. So I wanted to thank the ATTAC research team, our research coordinators, and sub eyes who are working tirelessly on this project to make it successful. And thanks again to everyone for listening. And thanks to the Department of Medicine for the invitation. Hopefully, Jeffer, you're on. All right. Thanks a lot, Brian. I'm going to find my screen here. Can everybody hear me? Yes. All right. So I bet nobody knows about the link between COVID-19 and um, fish oils, but there is one. Um, one of these new fish oils that we're going to be talking about. Can everybody see my screen? Not yet. Oh, okay. Hang on. So how do I do this? Uh, here we go. Just one second here. Share screen. All right. So they're actually looking at um, icosapen ethyl in, in COVID, which is kind of funny to me. So stay tuned. All right. Um, so I'm going to talk about fish oils, triglycerides, and the heart. Um, I have no disclosures. It's kind of an interesting um, interplay between fish oils. They have direct effects on the, the heart. And they obviously, as most people know, they, they lower triglycerides a lot. And then we know triglycerides... Um, have effects on the heart as well. So there's this kind of interesting uh, interplay and I wasn't sure whether I should talk about fish oils or triglycerides. So I'll try to talk a little bit about both um, in just 15 minutes. So you know, hopefully we'll get through all this. All right, so why should you care about triglycerides and fish oils? So the reason for this is something called residual risk. And I think a lot of people know about it, but it's the idea that you put people on their statin, you put people on their aspirin, and they continue to have cardiovascular events. And so this is looking at the, the major statin trials. And basically, um, yeah, we see a nice reduction in risk from placebo to um, the statin in the peel here. But what you kind of fail to realize maybe is that, um, you know, six to 20% of patients continue to have repeat cardiovascular events uh, despite being on statins. And this is only after treating for three to five years. So over a lifetime, that ends up being a lot of events. A lot of people said, well, you know, a little statin is good, but a lot of statin is even better. So maybe that's going to fix this problem of residual risk. And so we get people's LDLs down to the 62 range, which is pretty aggressive. And they still have this significant recurrence of, um, of ASCVD events. And if you look at patients with diabetes, it's even worse. So these are people with diabetes on statin, and, and their recurrent risk is between 10 to 30%. And again, this is only after three to five years. So the, the, what we're trying to get at is what else can we do to lower patients' risk? We shouldn't just be satisfied with aspirin and statin, and, and let's look further and see what else we can do. So one of the things that comes up um, is triglycerides, and, and triglycerides have been debated for a long time. I'm not going to go into all the details about um, all the trials that have been done looking at ASCVD events, but I'm just going to summarize it with this slide. This is a big meta-analysis, um, different populations, different countries. And the bottom line is elevated triglycerides were associated independently with an increased risk of cardiovascular disease. So I think we've answered the question that triglycerides do matter. Um, the, the question is, is do medications uh, to lower these triglycerides, do they actually, do they help? Um, and at what point should we be treating hypertriglyceridemia? I mean, we see this all the time where people's triglycerides are 150, 170, does that matter? Um, what's the kind of magic cutoff? So hopefully we'll, we'll get to that. So this is basically a slide of all the large randomized trials looking at 
fibrates in, um, in people who are either at increased risk for cardiovascular disease, they had cardiovascular disease or diabetes. And the primary endpoint was a little bit disappointing. Um, it's all going in the right direction. There does appear to be a reduction in cardiovascular events um, in people treated with fibrates, but they're not all statistically significant. So what's more interesting though, is when you look at a subgroup analysis of patients who had triglycerides greater than 200, all of a sudden you get this massive um, cardiovascular event reduction and they're all statistically significant. Now, we all know that subgroup analyses are, are fraught with statistical issues, but unfortunately, all the trials looking at treating hypertriglyceridemia were done in people who had very average elevated triglyceride levels. Um, and so the best we can do, at least right now, is, is do the, look at these subgroup analyses. And, and the magic number seems to be about 200 and above is where it really seems to be a big cut point that you appear to have benefit. But this is just one of the trials um, this is the primary endpoint looking at cardiovascular event reduction. There really was no, actually, sorry, this is for a subgroup analysis less than 200 of triglycerides, and there was really no difference in the event rate. But then when they looked at people, uh, patients with greater than 200, um, triglycerides greater than 200, you saw this pretty statistically significant uh, event reduction. So I, I think, you know, the data is not great, but the best that we have is that above 200 seems to matter, and that's kind of the cut point that I typically use. Now, this is also an interesting study. This was in the AIM High uh, subgroup analysis. And AIM High was the trial, if you guys recall, looking at niacin. And it really was looking at whether raising HDL seemed to matter. Um, and unfortunately, it was a negative trial. There did not seem to be benefit. But in one of the subgroups they looked at, these are people, again, the magic number of triglycerides greater than 200 and very low HDL. They found a statistically significant uh, reduction in cardiovascular events for people given niacin. So part of the problem with a lot of these trials is they were not done in people who had really high triglycerides. And two, these drugs are messy, right? So you have niacin and you have fibrates. They both lower LDL, they raise, I'm sorry, they, they raise HDL, they lower triglycerides. It's really hard to kind of tease apart what part of it may provide benefit. Um, so all you can do is kind of look at on average uh, what these, that these, these medications do appear to have some effect in selected um, populations. And again, the magic number appears to be triglycerides above 200. So you don't have to just believe me, this is the endocrinology guidelines from 2017. And in many ways, they're a little bit more aggressive and more progressive than a lot of the cardiology guidelines. Um, and so what they said was basically fibrates may improve ASCVD outcomes in primary and secondary prevention when triglycerides are above 200 and HDL is less than 40. So those are just two good numbers to remember. And I think an important thing to remember is when you see these patients with high triglycerides and low HDL, that is a marker for increased cardiovascular risk. And you really shouldn't be, um, uh, you shouldn't be happy with just putting them on a statin and calling it a day. You really want to look carefully at all their other modifiable risk factors, make sure they're on Mediterranean diet, make sure they're not smoking, all these kinds of things. And don't ignore these because these are very important numbers and they suggest a very vulnerable patient. So what about fish oils? Fish oils have had a long, long um, kind of history and it's quite interesting. I don't have a lot of time to talk about it. This is basically um, the 10 large trials looking at fish oil supplements. And I remember when I first came to Emory 12 years ago, I remember giving talks about fish oil. And here I am again giving a talk about fish oil. Um, what's really interesting with this, um, with this slide is you look at what they use for fish oil. And, and here's where the devil is in the details. So EPA and DHA are two different kinds of oils that are found in fish. And basically all the trials that we've done have looked at some combination. And what's interesting is the doses are completely different. The ratio of EPA to DHA is completely different. And so the idea that some of these trials have been positive and some have been negative is really not that surprising because the, the medications they were using are completely different. But what I really want to draw your attention to is the JELUS trial. So this was done in, um, in Japan in 2007, the largest of all of these trials. And what's really interesting is look what they used. They used 1,800 milligrams of EPA and not a single uh, bit of DHA. Completely different than all of these other ones. And this is the only one that was positive, that showed a real benefit. Every other one, well, I shouldn't say some of these have been positive, but weakly so. Jesse was positive, was weakly so. And a lot of these other ones are negative. So the, it really matters what kind of fish oil you're giving somebody, we think, at least. So this is the newest kid on the block, Icosapent ethyl. Um, the, the trade name is Vasipa, and it's 100% pure EPA. 
And, you know, this has been out now for five years or so. And I kind of ignored this uh, for a long time. I didn't think it really mattered. And then all of a sudden, um, they reduced this reduce it trial, which came out two years ago. And this really shocked everybody. Um, nobody was really, at least uh, most people I was were, were, were speaking with did not uh, expect to have this finding. It was a large randomized trial in people with ASCVD or diabetes, um, average triglycerides of 216, which is really important. They actually looked at people who actually had high triglycerides. They were already on a statin and pretty well treated. Their LDLs were 74, and they were given four grams of icosapen ethyl. So think about that with that other slide. They're getting 4,000 milligrams. That's completely different than what any of the other trials had done. And so when you have people say, well, this is just an uh, aberration, um, you know, all these trials have been kind of negative. It, this is a totally different trial. I think it's really important to remember that. So this is the primary endpoint. There was a 25% relative risk reduction um, in placebo compared to um, icosapen ethyl. So there's a benefit from icosapen ethyl. Um, and the number needed to treat was 21, which is really not all that much. That's a pretty impressive number needed to treat. And so they had a 20% relative risk uh, reduction in cardiovascular death, a reduction in fatal or non-fatal MI, and stroke as well. So it's a pretty robust kind of finding. And what I really can't believe is they almost got death from any cause. That is, high. I mean, it wasn't statistically significant, but it was really close. That is really, really hard to do. And the fact that they even got close is, is pretty impressive. So in terms of um, adverse events, really basically exa exactly the same between the two. There was nothing really worrisome there. Um, there was a little bit more peripheral edema, a little more constipation. And this AFib is very interesting. There was increased risk of AFib in the fish oil group. And that's interesting because actually there's been some evidence that fish oils reduces risk of AFib. And so it's really unclear to, to know what to make of it. I kind of tend to think this was just a a one-time event, um, and it wasn't really anything associated with icosapen ethyl, but I don't know that for a fact. I think it's very reassuring that the stroke reduction is there, um, and so uh, it doesn't stop me from prescribing it. Um, I will say if you have somebody with AFib and you put them on it and their AFib kind of goes crazy, then sure, you can stop it and see, but my experience has been that it hasn't made a, a big uh, so how is this working? We don't really know. Um, it does lower a lot of these markers, which we think matter. So LP, PLA2, CRP, oxidized LDL, ICAM, IL-6. We don't know, but it does seem to have all kinds of effects other than just lowering triglycerides. And so it's a very interesting um, uh, molecule. Now, one thing that has come up, and for those who know about reduced trial, they've probably heard about this. In the placebo group, they used a mineral oil. And a lot of people have said, well, this is why um, Reduce It was positive, was because mineral oil is really bad for you and it raises HDL a little bit, and it raised CRP a little bit, and that's why you saw um, a benefit of, um, of icosapent ethyl. Um, mineral oil is something that's been used before. This is, not a, this is not a new thing. They've done this before. They've done a lot of studies on it, and it does not appear to be all that active in terms of causing effects in the body. Um, but it has been raised as a possible reason. And there are people who don't really believe reduce a trial because of this mineral oil placebo. This was just a trial or not a trial. It was basically just an article published that shows and talks about um, the safety of mineral oil and how it doesn't appear to have really large effects. But I'm just letting you guys know that it's out there. Now, what's really interesting is they also did um, a follow-up trial where they basically um, cath these patients afterwards and looked for plaque progression um, in patients um, given icosapent ethyl. And this was a randomized double-blind trial in 80 patients. And what they found was just fascinating. So the blue bars here are icosapent ethyl and the red are all placebo. And what you see here is significant reduction in plaque with icosapent ethyl. So I mean, I think number one, that's just an impressive result to see. Number two, the people who say, well, this was all because of uh, mineral oil. I mean, if that was the case, you shouldn't have seen benefit from the uh, from mycosapen ethyl. You should have just seen maybe, you know, a little bit less progression. But this, they actually found regression of plaque. And so I really, I think it speaks to the fact that this is, uh, this uh, fish oil is doing something real. And it's not just a random event that we're seeing. Um, this was the data looking at the JELUS trial, which is a trial I talked to, talked to you about earlier. And to me, this in this group, they did not use a mineral oil placebo, um, and they still found benefit. 
So while I think that mineral oil issue is something to consider, I don't think it overrides the, the large benefit that we're seeing with, um, with icosapent ethyl. And you don't have to believe me, um, the 2019 uh, European guidelines also came out with their uh, guidelines about uh, triglycerides. And number one, I didn't have time to really talk about it, but um, elevated triglycerides, you certainly want to start statins first. Um, I don't think fish oils are the, the, the first line agent. However, once they're on statin, um, in patients with triglyceride levels that are elevated, despite statin therapy, um, that uh, icosapent ethyl should be considered in combination with statin and gave that a 2A recommendation. They gave using uh, phenofibrate a 2B recommendation. So I think that's it. Hopefully we have five minutes for our questions. Thank you all. Thank you guys so much that I learned a lot. I encourage everybody to put um, questions in the chat. Um, and actually you just, uh, your last slide stole the question I was gonna ask you, uh, Dr. Bear. Um, how expensive is icosapent ethyl? How available is this for, for our populations? Yeah, so that's a really interesting question. Um, you know, it, it is expensive. It's probably about $200 a month, so it is expensive. Um, the company Amarin just lost their patent, which is fascinating to me how they didn't have this figured out, but they lost their patent in the U.S. And so there are generic makers that are getting ready to move in. So hopefully in the next maybe year or two, there might be some generics available. Okay, because, because you, you sold me. I was about to ask you if you would, uh, uh, this would um, uh, circumvent statins plus fibrates in uh, people who have difficult time controlling triglycerides. And it sounds like the answer is yes. Yeah, and I didn't really talk about it, but you're right that, um, you know, for people with really high triglycerides, 500, 600, um, you know, you try to prevent pancreatitis, um, that absolutely fish oils help to lower that risk. Um, and so you can use it just, if you're purely just worried about really high triglycerides and pancreatitis, you can use um, fish oils to reduce the, the triglyceride level pretty significantly, somewhere between 40 to 50% at really high, at high doses. Not, I mean, the typical supplements people have been talking about for many years are very low level supplements that really don't do a whole lot, but four to six grams of fish oil will get your triglycerides down by about half. And I don't mean to ignore the other two presenters, but two quick questions just came up in the chat. Um, could you talk about vegetarian sources of EPA, such as flax, leafy greens, chia, and what about fatty liver? Does uh, fish oil or phenofibrate help that? Yeah, those are good questions. I mean, we just don't know. I mean, I typically tell patients to follow a Mediterranean diet. Um, anything that veers more towards um, vegetarian, I think is probably even better. Um, but we just don't know um, about that as much the trials haven't been done. In terms of fatty liver, I am unaware of anything uh, looking at that. I think the only thing I've seen is just uh, weight loss to help with, um, with NASH. Dr. Wells, a um, couple questions for you. Any role for anticoagulation of COVID-19 outpatients um, uh, with sort of more mild disease and should we risk stratify outpatients? Good question. So the answer is we don't know yet, but there are trials that are looking at this right now. So one of the multi-platform trials that I mentioned, not our trial attack, but um, Aptiv is enrolling outpatients and they're actually looking at anticoagulation as well as antiplatelet therapy for outpatients with COVID-19. There's another trial that I did not mention that we are a part of and we will start enrolling soon. And it's a collaboration between cardiology and Winship and that's Prevent HD. And that's a trial that we will treat uh, COVID-19 outpatients with Xarelto 10 milligrams, Rivaroxaban. Uh, and we'll see if that works. We don't, they, we don't know the answer to that yet, but a lot of our outpatients now are asking, if there's a, this prothrombotic state, what can I do? Should I take an aspirin? Should I continue my medications? Are there any interactions? Hopefully we'll answer all of those questions soon. Are there any, you know, I think uh, anticoagulation sort of whatever form you use is getting at, uh, an, at a later part of that cascade. We've obviously tried to use some really blunt tools like steroids for early inflammation. Are there any trials or thoughts about anything that is a little bit more elegant getting at this part of the pathophysiology? It's a good question. I don't know the answer to that. Okay. Dr. Abdu, you uh, um, uh, kind of uh, blew my general internist mind with uh, all of the new um, opportunities or options in uh, HEFREF. 
Um, I guess my first question is what, um, you know, it, 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 should all people now with HEFREF get referred to a cardiologist? Because this looks like a much more complicated landscape than, um, than I thought of, uh, than I was aware of. Yeah, Dr. Armstrong, you're absolutely right. When I was in training, actually, I was like, escape was when beta blockers came out. It totally changed the, the way we practice and way we look into physiology of heart failure. And, you know, um, in two years after I started practicing as an attending and all this like gush of new agents and data coming out. So um, it is becoming more and more complex. And, um, you know, to end to the short answer to your question is that the document, the 2021 document that I just uh, referred to um, actually has guidance on when to refer your patient to a heart failure specialist. Uh, I like to always quote the acronym they use or mnemonic they use. It's I need help. Uh, look into that. It's, 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 it's an interesting uh, way that they uh, uh, frame the acronym. But yes, it's, as treatment come out, it's, it's going to become more complex. It's going to become more expensive. Um, these treatments are very, very highly in, high in cost. However, you know, one thing that I always like to say that, uh, yes, challenges in access uh, and, and of therapy is, is a real challenge and cost is a real thing. However, do not lose track of science. Um, you know, at some point, Carvidolol, now that you can get uh, for free, was at some point $300 a month. Uh, you know, so, you know, don't lose track of science. Uh, there's a lot coming out. Um, actually, I was very, very um, relieved when I, uh, if you remember the slide that I showed you, the collaboration, um, people are looking into this. So hopefully, uh, you know, we will we'll tackle it and, and come, up, uh, come up with something that serves the patient, which is the, the number one utmost priority for us. So um, it looks like that we will need more heart failure specialists in the field very, very soon, because there's other new medications in the pipeline coming up too. So it will become more and more complex. Thanks. I appreciate you uh, you really addressing that because um, and, and we're at time. But that was what I was going to ask you: is are we really developing a two class system for those who can um, both adhere to uh, complex medication regimens, but also afford complex medication regimens um, with new therapies that don't have generics? So um, yeah. So I think yeah, following the science and and being patient are, are is at least a, a good advice and a good direction. Um, Jeffrey, Jeffrey, thank you so much for handling the chat. I see that you're answering it because we won't get to all of those questions. Thank the three of you, uh, Dr. Wells, Dr. Abdu, Dr. Bear, for this really great update in recent advances in cardiology um, and bringing us all a little bit closer to 2021. Um, I appreciate uh, you guys and you stayed perfectly on time. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all. Have a good day. <laughs>